Welcome everyone to tonight's workshop on how to memorize orgo reactions and reagents. This workshop is very different from any that I typically teach and that's because with every video you watch, with every workshop, with every YouTube tutorial, I always stress one thing. Understand, don't memorize. So why am I teaching you how to memorize today? Well, no matter how much you understand, you still have to have a level of memorization partly because there's a lot that you need to remember in organic chemistry, and partly because, let's face it, you're going to memorize anyway, so you may as well learn how to memorize things the right way to help you get through everything that you need to remember your reactions, to remember your reagents, to know what to do on your quizzes and exams. So we are going to look at how to learn and understand the reagents. Again, I'm going back on what I said, because memorization isn't really just memorizing, it's how to build a solid foundation for that memorization. And that's the first thing we're gonna talk about. I'll give you some memory tricks to help you make it faster, easier, and help you retain longer. I'll show you how to memorize the right way. I have an excellent organic chemistry reagent guide as a must, must have resource that I'll talk about. And of course, we'll do Q&A at the end. Okay, so memorization, as difficult and scary as it sounds, is actually very easy. If you follow these simple steps. Step number one, understand. Step number two, memorize. And step number three, rinse and repeat, or just repeat, 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 which you should be thinking in your head as practice, practice, practice. Sounds simple enough, right? Yep, definitely simple enough. But as I stressed before, it's not just about the act of memorizing, it's how you do it. So let's take a look at the first step, understand. The first time I took organic chemistry, I memorized everything. I looked at my notes and I memorized them. I looked at the homework and I memorized the answers and I got to the exam and I didn't recognize some questions and I completely bombed it. I had to withdraw from organic chemistry because unfortunately memorization was not enough. There's something that I learned in the military called trust but verify. I believe what you're saying. I'm not saying I don't trust you and I'm not saying I don't believe you, but I wanna verify it for myself. Have you ever showed up to class and everybody's sitting in the dark? There are 20 students in their seats. They're all sitting in the dark. Nobody thinks to touch the light switch. That's happened to me a few times, and I ask someone, why are we sitting in the dark? The light doesn't work. It doesn't work? Okay. Flick the light switch, and the lights come on. What happened? It's not that I didn't believe you the lights didn't work. I just wanted to see for myself. And if I flick the switch and nothing happens, great. I just confirmed that it doesn't work. Same thing happened. You show up to class. Everybody's sitting on the floor or standing around outside. Why isn't anybody going in? The classroom's locked. Sometimes it was, but sometimes nobody thought to try the door. Try the door and look at that, it's open. It's not that I didn't believe you that it was locked. I just wanted to verify it for myself. What does that have to do with reagents? A lot of times you learn a reaction and you just assume that your professor is correct. You just assume your TA or your tutor or whoever's teaching you is correct. So you don't think to take it a step further. When you learn a reaction, trust that what they're telling you is correct, but verify why the thing happens the way it does. So for example, you learn Markovnikov's rule. What's Markovnikov's rule tell you? What does it mean? And Colin makes a good point. Colin says, a thirst for knowledge should never be simply quenched by someone you think you know. You should seek to know for yourself. That's beautiful. I love that. So a lot of you are saying that Markovnikov's rule adds to the more substituted, more substituted carbon. Hydrogen wants to go to hang out with his friends. Yeah, and this sounds like something that someone told you or you read somewhere or you learned somewhere and you memorized. But what if you're faced with something that doesn't necessarily follow Markovnikov's rule or has some sort of exception. If all you did was memorized, how are you going to know how to change it when that change arises? So what you want to think of, and let's quickly review Markovnikov's rule so you actually see what I'm referring to. Markovnikov's rule tells us that if we have 
something like this, for example, an asymmetrical alkene, and we're doing a reaction that has a carbocation intermediate, for example, adding HBr, the rule tells us where things are going to go on this asymmetrical molecule. So according to Markovnikov's rule, the bromine is going to add to the more substituted carbon, and the hydrogen is going to add to the less substituted carbon. This is what you memorized. So adding more substituted, some of you gave me that. Hydrogen adding to the carbon that has more hydrogen, some of you gave me that as well. What does Markovnikov's rule actually tell you? What is the understanding logical component behind this rule to make sure that you're understanding it or to make sure that you know how to get this right? So for example, if I give you the same question, but now I put the pi bond here between the first and second carbon on the right, you're not going to give me an answer that is straight up memorization. You're not going to put the bromine here because that is incorrect. If you thought carbocation, you are absolutely correct. If you thought most stable intermediate, you're absolutely correct. What Markovnikov's rule tells us is that the intermediate that's going to form is going to be the most stable possible intermediate. So for the first one, when the pi bond breaks, we put a carbocation at the tertiary position that would be the most stable intermediate. And then when bromine adds, it goes to the carbocation because bromine just wants to attack something positive, having a negative charge. If we look at the other molecule, which is the same thing, I just noticed I drew it upside down because if you count the carbons, this would be on the second carbon. That would be the second carbon. So it looks a little different, meant to do the same thing. But if we break this up and look at the carbocation intermediate, initially the carbocation would form here. But if you understand that the carbocation has to be the most stable, most substituted carbocation possible, and you'll recognize the trick, again, based on understanding, that any time you have a secondary carbocation near a tertiary carbon, you're going to have a hydrate shift. This gives you a very quick second intermediate where the hydrogen, we'll show it in gray here, moved over to the secondary position. The carbocation is now at the tertiary position. That's why our product is incorrect. Not because you memorize, but because you understand. Now, if you understand what I said, then yes, you can go ahead and memorize this trick. This is what I mean by understanding. Don't just memorize something just because you saw it or heard it or feel like this is the right answer. Memorize based on understanding because when you memorize, straight up memorization, and you forget, you get to your exam, you don't remember the answer, you panic, it's very hard to come out of that. But if you understand, and you get to that exam, and you panic, and you forget, you can still derive the answer based on things that you understand, based on clues that you recognize, and you're not just drawing a blank, you're actually drawing from what you see on the paper. So if your professor ever tells you, oh, don't worry about how it happens, just memorize, you want to question that. Maybe it's too complicated to explain and it's easier to just memorize. Or maybe the person teaching you just doesn't want to go into the details. And then I would challenge you to go look it up for yourself. Understand it just the once. Don't go memorizing a crazy reaction. But understand it enough to give you a solid foundation for your memorization. Now some of them are pretty easy. Like HBR, very simple mechanism. But if you find a complicated mechanism, for example, how many of you studied alkene reactions and you studied ozonolysis, but you didn't have to memorize the mechanism? In the comments, I see that most of you didn't have to memorize it and some of you did. So how would you learn a reaction if you don't actually have to know it? I would still look it up. I would understand enough of the pieces so that it makes sense once and then you can have a trick. So if you look at my O's analysis video, after I go through the whole mechanism, I just show you a very simple trick. And I'm not going to do the mechanism here. It's going to take too long. But if we have an alkene that looks like this,
and you've gone through the mechanism and you understand how it breaks and you understand where the oxygen's at, then you can go ahead and memorize a trick based on recognizing that ozonolysis, which has a bunch of oxygen, O3, is going to add oxygen when it breaks the pi bond, so we add one here and one here. A trick memorized based on understanding will be much easier to remember in the long run. So we understand that we need to understand. That's the absolute most important part. The second thing is memorization, right? After you understand it, if you don't actually take the time to memorize, you'll have a very, very hard time coming back with the complex, the lengthy, the detailed crazy reagents. When you've attempted to memorize reagents in the past, have you stared at a set of flashcards? Or more importantly, have you been the dedicated student who sits down for an hour with a stack of flashcards about 10 feet high and you just stare at them over and over and over, trying to cram it all into your head? And if you've done that, be honest, if you've done that, maybe not 10 feet high, but definitely a foot high, does it work? Miriam says, yes, and they don't stick. Ah, Dana, you, you're jumping ahead. You're absolutely good. Ingrid said that never worked for me. And I'm seeing a lot of comments that it's too much information to remember, and it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. I'm with you. When it comes to memorizing information, there is a limit to how much your brain can take in at once. And the way we overcome the limit and I don't know the exact science behind it. I did see a study once. But there's a limit to how much you can remember. And the key here is how much you can remember at one time. So how do we overcome that limit? Well, we find a way to reduce the how much. And we find a way to reduce the one time. So let's start backwards. The one time is if you're trying to memorize so much by cramming for an hour, your brain's going to hit that ceiling. So if you take that one hour, you can have it at once versus break it up. And then the how much is going to be a combination of keep it simple, study just a few things at a time, and more importantly, Valerie says patterns. If you can find patterns and similarities in what you're trying to memorize, then suddenly trying to memorize 10 different reagents is not really 10 different reagents. And I keep using alkene reactions because it's a pretty simple foundation topic that everyone hopefully remembers. If you had your alkene reactions, you had a couple of different types. You had the mechanisms that you learned and then the reactions that you didn't necessarily have a mechanism for. So a lot of you may have learned ozonolysis or cyclopropene, cyclopropanation, um, KMNO4 oxidation, things like that, where you didn't have the mechanism. Some of you, unfortunately, did have the mechanism. But within the mechanisms, you had the Markovnikov and the anti-Markovnikov, the carbocation, the no-carbocation intermediate. So let's keep it simple and look at the example of an alkene that follows Markovnikov's rule. How many of those reagents, how many different reagents have you studied for alkene reactions that follow Markovnikov's rule, specifically with a carbocation intermediate? Well, let's see. You had hydrohalogenation, so you probably learned the reaction mechanism for HBr and HCl. You had acid-catalyzed hydration, so that would be H2O. I'll just write acid. But you probably didn't stop there. With the H2O, you probably had an alcohol. So maybe you saw something like CH3OH and acid. Maybe you saw another alcohol with an acid. And this right here is pretty simple, five reagents. So you sit there, and you memorize, and you memorize. And again, I'm using a very simple example to prove a point. But this is five unique reactions. What if instead you looked for the pattern and you tried to see what is similar between them? What is common about all of them? Well, these two are HX. That's a pattern. These three kind of look the same. Anytime you learn a mechanism with alcohol versus water, I like to use the backpack trick. 
Here's the backpack trick. If we have a water molecule, what about this molecule makes it reactive? Well, let's see. There's a lot of different things on water depending on the situation we're looking at. Some of you are saying that we have the lone pairs. The lone pairs are nucleophilic. They like to attack things. We have a polar bond between oxygen and hydrogen, making the hydrogen partially positive and the oxygen partially negative. And then depending on the situation, the hydrogen can get attacked by something negative or the oxygen can attack something positive or partially positive. I want you to imagine you're walking down the street. You are you. You look like yourself. Some days you look different. Maybe your hair changes. Maybe your makeup changes. If you wear makeup, maybe what you're carrying changes. But overall, you're still you. Now imagine that you are walking to school. And assuming you're old-fashioned, you don't have a laptop. Back in the day when I went to school, we had backpacks with heavy books. And let me tell you, they weighed a ton each. If you're walking with a backpack, and say you have your Orgo book and your physics book and some other book, maybe you're a little bit hunched over, you got that giant book bag with you, are you still you? Just with a backpack making you slightly different? Yeah, you're still you. You just happen to be carrying a lot of baggage with you. So if you see a water molecule and you recognize that oxygen and hydrogen are the reactive components, assuming we have another molecule with oxygen and hydrogen as the reactive components, does it matter if it's attached to a hydrogen or happens to be attached to something like a carbon that has hydrogen, a CH3 group? The oxygen is still partially negative because of those nucleophilic electrons. The hydrogen is still partially positive because of that polar bond. And it happens to be wearing a backpack, which could slow it down. It could provide some steric hindrance, right? It might be harder to get onto the train with a giant book bag, especially if you're taking it at 8 o'clock in the morning in New York. So when you're looking at these reactions, don't overwhelm yourself with, okay, so I have oxymercuration, but then I have alkoxymercuration, and that's a completely different reaction that I now have to memorize. No, it's just a backpack. So that's one way to group all of these, but then you can take it a step further. Yes, you have to know the mechanism, but ultimately, what is it that you do with this reaction? You break the pi bond, you put a hydrogen on the least substituted position, and then what do you add here? Anytime you have your hydrogen bound to something that is partially negative, don't you simply just cut off the hydrogen and add the other piece here? So HBr, we would just add a bromine. HCl, we just add a Cl. H2O, just think of it as HOH, and we cut off that partially positive hydrogen. And I only refer to one so that you can see the similarities. Same thing with the alcohol, we just cut off the hydrogen. So no matter what you're given, by looking at the pattern, it's fewer reagents to memorize because we're just looking at hydrogen bound to something that can lose a hydrogen, that something can get a negative charge and ultimately attack, we turn five reagents into one, making it much, much easier to memorize. You'll still want to pay attention to everything else, but it reduces the stress a little bit because if you see something on your exam that you don't recognize, a lot of students get thrown off by the alcohol. Right? A lot of students will know oxymercuration, but the second they see ethanol, they don't know what to do. So this is the same idea. If I don't recognize ethanol, but ethanol is E-T-O-H, and I know how to add an O-H, can't I still derive the answer, even if it's a reagent that I have never seen before? That's what I want you to think of. And then let's go back to the at one time. Sitting down for an hour for memorization, I have learned the hard way, doesn't work. We had a core music class that we had to take. And for this class, we basically listened to a piece in every class, learned about the piece, took some notes. And then for the exam, the professor would play a couple of seconds of that track. We would have to identify the track, everything that we had to learn about it, and then write an essay. I think, uh, not an essay, but like a paragraph. And we had a couple of pieces for every exam. For the first exam, I started studying a couple days before, and I had a lot of a, lot, a very difficult time recognizing the pieces because try memorizing an entire set of music, I don't know, it was like 20 different songs, in a couple of days it doesn't work. For the next exam, I learned my lesson, I took 
all the pieces that we needed for the next exam, put it onto a CD. Yes, we're talking about that long ago. Put it onto a CD. And in fact, I used to play it on my CD DVD player, dating myself here, every morning as I was going through my morning routine, uh, brushing my teeth, going to the bathroom, getting dressed, you know, everything I had to do in the morning, I would listen to this CD over and over and over just in, as background music. And then when I sat down to actually memorize things, you play a couple of notes and the rest of the song would come to mind because I recognized it so well. So all I had to do was study the information like the artists and the dates and all that fun stuff. With reagents, you probably don't want to have a CD playing in the background, although it won't hurt to actually listen to videos while you're eating, while you're working out, things like that. The other thing I want to challenge you is what if instead of studying for one hour at a time, you break up that hour throughout the day? So I want you to think about all the minutes that you have when you're not really doing anything and see if you can use that time to memorize. If you're carrying physical flashcards, I recommend keeping a maximum of 10 in your pocket. More than 10 in one day is going to be overwhelming. Now let's see where we can find uh, the minutes. The average commercial on TV is about three minutes. Um, most of you probably don't watch commercials anymore, but say you're watching from a streaming app, you might have, uh, I was binging Supergirl this weekend. So in the beginning, it has the intro, and I've already seen the intro and all the dozens of episodes prior. So that's about, I don't know, 30 seconds. If you're streaming from a site that has ads, those could be 15 to 30 seconds. While you're waiting for the bus, waiting for your friend, waiting for your professor to come in, waiting for your Starbucks coffee, these are little 30-second to 5-minute chunks of time. If you're at work all day, every time you go to the bathroom, you finish your business, you wash your hands, you study a couple of flashcards before going back to your desk. If you work at the kind of job where you can sneak away for a few seconds mentally, stare at a flashcard. I used to study flashcards when I worked on the ambulance at red lights. <laughs> so if I was driving at the red light, I would pick up a flashcard that I kept in the coffee cup holder and I would study them. So I haven't been writing these down, but you can uh, TV while waiting online for coffee, waiting for a person, waiting for anything. Um, bathroom breaks. And if you're not taking enough bathroom breaks during the day, you're not drinking enough. So start drinking more just so you can study more. Anyone else have a suggestion? We have a couple of seconds. Allison says, who has time to watch TV? Once a week, you can reward yourself for studying and take a night off. And during that TV time, you can study. A commuting travel, definitely, definitely during travel. Don't get into an accident, though. If you're driving, it's always safety first. Uh, before class, that would be in the waiting category, because if your professor is five minutes late, everybody's on their phone anyway. You might as well. All right, so can you find at least 15 minutes in your day that you didn't think of before that you can now dedicate strictly to memorization? I see comments about different apps for memorization. So I see Quizlet, Anki, absolutely whatever app you like. You have your smartphone on you all the time anyway. So if you're waiting for your Starbucks instead of checking Instagram or Facebook, use your flashcard app and study a few more. Waiting on the microwave to heat up lunch, yeah. Now here's the problem. Sometimes you're very efficient and you memorize and you understand really well and then you don't remember them anymore. How many of you are in or go to right now and you have completely forgotten a lot of the reagents you learned in Orgo 1? So for example, you're doing a multi-step synthesis problem and you know you need an alkyne, but you don't remember how to create it. You can't remember what it is that you used to turn that alkene into an alkyne, for example. And I'm seeing a lot of yeses, which brings us back to the third step. Just because you have it memorized doesn't mean you're going to remember. So you have to find a way to constantly go back to the old material and just repetition over and over and over. Does that mean you should spend hours a day reviewing 
things you learned months ago? Not necessarily, but what if you were to dedicate 15 minutes every week just for reviewing the old information? You're going to be the person who gets full synthesis credit because you remembered not only what you learned this chapter and last exam, but also what you learned last semester. Let's go a little bit more detailed into the memorizing and repetition. There's no real right or wrong way. It's more about doing it better and more efficiently. So we already discussed some of this, but the first thing I want to point out is quality versus quantity. I would rather see you focus. Wow, I started writing quality and quantity at the same time. Let's try that again quality versus quantity. I would rather see you focusing on memorizing 10 reagents at a time very, very clearly than trying to jam 100 pieces of data into your head and not remembering a thing by the time you let some time pass, by tomorrow or the day after or the day after. Okay, so we discussed that one. Next thing I want to look at is long-term versus short-term. When you study and you sit there and you repeat it over and over and over, it's not just one and done because sometimes you'll remember it and you'll be able to recite everything. And how many of you have done that when you feel you have something memorized and you go to sleep and then the next day you only have half of it memorized and you forgot the other half? I'm seeing a lot of yeses. The reason is that a lot of times you start out with memorization by putting it into your short-term memory and with additional exposure with continued practice it's slowly gonna go into your long-term memory your goal is to find a way to put it into your long-term memory so that you remember it as time goes on say you want to spend an hour memorizing a certain set of reagents we already talked about breaking up throughout the day but what if you break this up throughout the week so instead of doing the same 10 flashcards for an hour one day, what if you do it 10 to 15 minutes a day, multiple days in a row, you're much more likely to learn it, remember it, go to sleep, forget some of it, wake up the next day, learn it again, memorize it again, it'll be faster the second time around, go to sleep, maybe forget it again, over and over and over. By the time the seventh day comes around, if you forgot it six days, where you learned it and forgot it and learned it and forgot it for six days in a row, chances are you're not going to forget it a seventh time. Now this is the most fun part. Make it memorable. How many times have you looked at these things and you're thinking, what the heck is going on? This is so boring that I can't even wrap my mind around it. When I teach reactions, I always, always stress. If you want to understand these things, give them human characteristics. Relate the molecules that you don't get to people you know or scenarios you've experienced and suddenly they make more sense. So for example, in my substitution elimination series, we talk about the strong attackers as bullies. It's very easy to picture a bully just walking up to a little kid and punching him in the face to grab a swing. And then we look at the one type, the weak attackers, as the non-bullies, the ones that are scared, the ones that wait and wait until finally the bully gets bored of the swing and walks away. If you don't remember strong and weak, but you can wrap your mind around the bully versus non-bully, you have a much easier time remembering it. So give them human characteristics, or for example with, um, how many of you have studied EAS and know the monster trick? This is one way to remember your substituent. So if this is some weird looking monster, that's his hair. Then the eyes are the O for ortho. The mouth is the M for meta. And the tongue is the P for para. If you have a hard time just remembering what's what, you have something that you can look at. You have something that you can recognize. What else? I'm trying to think of some of the different tricks I use. If you have an alkene and you're doing a reaction, what would I get if I react this with MCPBA?
epoxide, absolutely. And if you're thinking about the mechanism and trying to understand why these would stay exactly where they are, I just like to think of the pi bond breaking and skewering the oxygen. If they're both skewering the oxygen, it makes sense that the product has an oxygen sticking up like that. So whatever you're looking at, ask yourself, is there something that I can do to take this out of just reaction reagent product? Something else that I can, a little characteristic, a, a mnemonic, something that stands out that makes it slightly more memorable. And here's my advice on, mnemonic, on mnemonics. The funnier, the weirder, or the dirtier the mnemonic, the more likely you're going to remember it. And you don't even have to reach so far to figure out how to make it memorable. Sometimes it's really just about looking for clues in that thing. So for example, if you're thinking about redox, what mnemonics have you used in the past to remember what is oxidation and what is reduction? I see oil rig and Leo Gurr. My favorite is actually Leo the Lion says Gurr. So Leo the Lion says Gurr, and I actually learned this from one of my high school students, which stands for loss of electrons oxidation, gain electrons reduction. What does this have to do with organic chemistry? Not that much, unless you take it to the next level. In organic chemistry, when we're talking about redox, we're typically adding or removing which specific atom? Two that I'm thinking, oxygen and hydrogen, absolutely correct. If we think of an electron and we add a proton to it, we just got hydrogen, right? Because one hydrogen is a proton and electron if we're talking about the standard isotope. So you can think of it as loss of hydrogen and the opposite, just think of hydrogen and oxygen as opposite of each other. Loss of hydrogen, gain of oxygen is oxidation, oxygen, oxidation. And gain of hydrogen, which would be loss of oxygen, would be reduction. How many reagents do you know of that give you redox reactions? List all the ones you can remember. I'll write some of them down as they come in. I see OSO4. That's OSO4. KMNO4. LAH, which is actually LIALH4, same thing. NABH4. O3. PCC is a tricky one, so I'll write it in a different color. Dibal is also a tricky one, unless you spell it with a hydrogen. Okay, let's stop here. These are a couple of simple ones. We don't have to go too crazy to try to find out if it's oxidation or reduction. We simply look at the pattern. OSO4, it's got an oxygen. KMNO4, it's got oxygen. O3, it's got oxygens. Having so many oxygens kind of tells us it's probably an oxidation reaction. So many times when I'm asking for reduction, students give me these. But oxidation has got so many oxygens. I put PCC in red because it's not obvious what it is, but if you know it's peridinium chlorochromate, where the chromate has a ton of oxygen, that makes it uh, easier to remember. Na2Cr207, that's also O7, that's got a lot, so let's add that to the list. And we have more oxygen. If we're looking at reduction, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride, dibal is just a different version of the aluminum hydride. We have so many hydrogens, uh, NaH, that's another good one, yes. We have so many hydrogens, it makes sense we're doing a reduction or a hydrogen type reaction, right? So do you see how the reagents very clearly give it away? So if you're giving me this right here for oxidation, I'm going to be very disappointed in your answer because I want you to pay attention rather than just memorizing. A lot of students will memorize alcohol to carboxylic acid and back, but they go so into rote memorization, they sometimes forget which direction it is but this will tell you about the direction.
Earlier, when I asked about sitting down and memorizing a stack of flashcards, some of you said that you rewrite them. And I said you were jumping ahead to another trick, and that is absolutely correct. The next recommendation I have is to engage your senses. If you're just staring at flashcards or staring at a flashcard app, you're only using your eyes. What if you take it to the next step and try to make it a little bit more of an active process? How do you make it more active? Well, let's see. Instead of just staring at it, why don't you say it out loud? If you're in public and you can't, you can whisper it because your mouth forming the words, even if no sound is actually coming out, is already using more of your senses. What if you write and rewrite? If you're writing it, you're looking at it, your hands are forming the letters, forming the reagents, forming the reactions. Your eyes are seeing it come to life. Sometimes on exams, I didn't just remember what I studied. I remember that I highlighted something in pink or that it was a long paragraph at the top of the page because having the experience or there was certain background music going on that helps me remember it a little better. Having different senses interact while you're studying makes it more likely that you're participating. It gets your brain much more engaged, and it's more than just passively staring at flashcards, which honestly is not that effective. Parisa places rosemary oil on a tissue and smell it while studying. I like that. Colin uses colors. Absolutely. I, I mean, <laughs> guys, look at this, right? Imagine we did all this in black and white, like that. I have ADHD. I would probably tune out, and you guys don't want me to tune out while I'm actually teaching a workshop, right? Use colors, get some highlighters, get some markers. And another thing you want to do is not just focus on what it is, make connections, or use it in examples. So what does this mean? If you're trying to memorize a reagent, don't just write out that reagent, KMNO4 oxidation, KMNO4 oxidation. No. What does KMNO4 oxidize? Give me an example. So let's keep it simple again, alkene reactions. Say you're studying that KMNO4 hot concentrated is going to take a pi bond, and I'll put a triangle for heat and concentrated and basic uh, basic followed by acid. These are technical things you should find out what your professor wants. The trick is similar to O's analysis, where you're going to get something that looks like this for the first half and something that looks like this for the second half. We get two carboxylic acids. Again, if this is a base, it would have been followed by acids because a base would have given you a carboxylate, another technical thing to memorize. Let's say this is what you're studying. So instead of having just this on a flashcard and rewriting this same exact reaction, the danger here is that you will have memorized that trans-2-butene, whether you want to or not, gives you two carboxylic acids that are two carbons each, two ethanoic acid. That's dangerous because what if you're given a five-carbon chain or a six-carbon ring with an alkene in it? So what you want to do is take an example. You don't have to get too crazy. You don't have to be too inventive. But what if you take this same alkene and you rewrite the reaction a couple of times? Then you add a methyl group to it. Then you turn it into a ring. Then you turn it into a substituted ring. And instead of rewriting this five times, write this with the reaction three times. Then write this with the reaction three times. Then write this with the reaction three times. This makes sure you're not just getting into the, you're not getting tunnel vision on one single thing. This makes sure that if you take a molecule and you have a concept and then you change the molecule, the concept still applies. You change the molecule a little more, the concept still applies. And then if your professor decides on the exam to give you something that looks like, let's go nuts that looks like this with a pi bond here and a pi bond here and a pi, something like that, and you react it with excess KMNO4, you know exactly what to do. You've never seen this before, but you have an idea of what to do with each of these pieces. You understand how to change it, 
And then hopefully this right here suddenly doesn't feel so scary. And if you're wondering about the answer, cut, 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 cut. And that would be a ketone because it's not terminal. That would also be a ketone. And if they're secondary, they'd be carboxylic acids. Very simple if you understand it. How many of you like to take princess showers? When I was deployed in the Middle East, on, we were on the oil platform. And oil platforms, if you're not familiar with it, are basically these giant structures in the middle of nowhere where oil is pumped onto ships, and the ships take them to all the different countries. We didn't have access to a lot of facilities because we were in the middle of nowhere. So we had giant reverse osmosis tanks. We made our own clean water for showering, not for drinking that we got brought to us. So one rule we had on the deployment was no princess showers. What's a princess shower? Princess showers are long showers. <laughs> now we got it to the point where I, I was able to take a three to four minute shower at some point. Now when I'm trying to be fast, maybe 10 minutes. But sometimes you just want to stay under the hot water. You're done shampooing your hair. You're done soaping. You're done whatever you want. And you just don't want to leave. So what if you had a legitimate excuse to stay under the hot water, assuming it's not going to run out and nobody's going to yell at you for wasting the water? What if you had a legitimate excuse to stay under the hot water? What if you called it studying? So I created a, a link that redirects to Amazon. Laverside.com slash markers. This will take you to shower markers on Amazon. You could also pick these up at Walmart or whatever local store has them. These are markers that you can use to write on your shower walls and erase them. So if you're in the shower and you don't want to get out, ask yourself, what did I just study? Oh, yeah, oxidation. What are all the reagents I remember? Write them on the shower wall. Erase them. Can I write a couple of examples? Well, it, alcohol oxidation, okay, so let me write a primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol. Like, take the time to actually work through detailed step-by-step -step mechanisms. See how far you get. And if you get stuck, when you get out of the shower, run to your notes, compare, don't erase it. Run to your notes, compare, see what you missed. And then the next time you're sitting down to study, you can kind of take it to the next level. So this is another fun way to fortify what you're doing. See a comment, I use bathtub markers. Yes, yeah, so shower markers, shower crayons, bathtub crayons, they come under a lot of different names, same thing. And I have a student who uses dry erase markers on her bathroom mirror, same idea. So this is just one example. You could do the same thing on a dry erase board, like a whiteboard, uh, mirrors, mirrors work well, right? Whatever it takes. And then sometimes you come across reagents that you never heard of. So let's say you're studying reactions and your professor covered a couple in class, your chapter covered a couple, then you get to the end of chapter questions or a practice quiz and the reagent just looks completely unfamiliar. What do you do? Well, typically the first thing you do is you go to Google. Half the time Google's not correct or the information is conflicting, you're not very sure. So what I recommend, I told you in the beginning I would talk to you about a must, must have resource. What I recommend is the Organic Chemistry Reagent Guide, Ebony, don't panic first. <laughs> um, the Organic Chemistry Reagent Guide published by James from MasterOrganicChemistry.com. Basically what he did is go through tons and tons of reagents from different books. This guy has been, he's got a PhD in organic chemistry, tutoring for many, many years. So he's gone through a lot of different resources and compiled a massive, massive guide that is digital. So you don't have to search through pages. You just do control function, like a, a search function, like control F on a PC. And that will help you find it. And I highly, highly, highly recommend the reagent guide. So you can get that. I created a simple link to redirect because, again, it's a long, tedious link. Layoverside.com slash guide is going to take you to a page that has the information about it. Highly, highly recommend getting it. So it starts out with basics about functional groups and uh, just different simple things. And then it goes very, very detailed into all the different types of reagents, what they do, what their names are, the reactions. And I know a lot of you already have it, so I'm seeing comments here. Sam says it's so much better than my textbook. Colin says it's so cool. Absolutely recommend it. 
So it's not going to go into crazy, crazy detail that you don't need, but it's very simple as in here's the reagent, here's the name, here's what it does, here's the reaction. And for the important ones, he's also got the mechanisms. What's cool about this guide is that I think it's so awesome, I asked him to give my students a discount. Now, that's not expensive at all, but it's still nice to not have to pay so much for all the different things that you're getting for school. So a 15% refund makes it um, slightly more affordable. And I do get a small commission when you sign up through, when you sign up and you get the discount, but obviously that's not why I'm recommending it. I'm recommending it because it's an absolutely amazing, amazing must have guide. I'll take some quick questions about it and then we'll continue. So the first question on the guide is, I'm an Orga one, do you still recommend it? Yeah, so I get this from a lot of students, especially in Orga one, because when you're just starting organic chemistry, you're not coming across as many reagents as much as concepts and mechanisms initially. So I still recommend getting it because as you get more and more advanced, right? Think of Orga 1. You did naming and structure, acids, bases, uh, stereochemistry, things like that. But once you get into reactions, alkenes, alkynes, radicals, substitution elimination, that's when it starts to get overwhelming. So that's when I highly, highly recommend it. Especially if you're going into Orgo 2. Orgo 2, every week you come up with new crazy reagents in the chapter. So if you're not taking Orgo 2 because you only need one semester, it's recommended. If you are taking Orgo 2, it is an absolute must. Question, I'm studying for the DAT, do you still recommend it? That's a little more of a tricky question because exams like the MCAT, the PCAT, the DAT, have a lot of organic chemistry, but they're multiple choice and it's not all organic chemistry. So I still recommend it, but I'm not gonna say it's a must have compared to students taking the class. If it's something that works in your budget, I absolutely highly recommend it. If you're taking organic chemistry, find a way to pay for it because for you it's an absolute must. We'll talk about the guide a little bit more later because I wanna continue with um, memorization type examples. So let's go back to the idea of the act of writing. So we talked about writing this out like this, but let's go back to the example we did over here. So we found the similarity, we found the pattern. If you're trying to memorize this, having already identified the pattern, you can have 20 to 50 different reactions just taking an alkene, reacting it with these five things. Switching that alkene a little, reacting it again, making a symmetrical versus asymmetric, chiral versus achiral product, right? Try to think of the slight change you can make to the molecule to give you a completely new example that you can continue practicing. Okay, so some suggestions for active writing. I call this active writing because you're writing in an active study process. This would include um, vary the reagent. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Some of the reagents are very specific, but sometimes if it's water versus alcohol, you can turn this into water, methanol, ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, tert-butyl alcohol, and that gives you so many different examples. You can vary the reactant, meaning the starting molecule, and a couple of ideas are symmetry, vary the symmetry, symmetrical, asymmetrical, degree of substitution, primary, secondary, tertiary. If you have a leaving group, if you have a pi bond, you can make each one primary, secondary, or tertiary. You can have linear versus a ring. Let me tell you something, guys. I can show you any sort of reaction. Students will get it. The second I turn it into a ring, half the students panic. Do you panic when you see a ring show up on your exam for a reaction you already know you know? I'm seeing a lot of yeses. I'm seeing some noes, but mostly yeses. What if you prepare for that? With every reaction you study, you go linear, ring, two rings. Linear, ring, two rings. So for example, we did the KMNO4 earlier. We went with linear, different linear. We went with the ring, we went with the substituted ring. What if we change the ring size? Make it a cyclobutene, a cyclopentene, a cyclohexene. Just mess with it so that no matter what your professor comes up with, you're not scared because you've seen it. 
Colin says, vary the functional groups. Absolutely. Make sure that it won't mess with the reaction, but you can change the functional group on the molecule. You can swap the molecules. You can connect multiple pieces or multiple reactions. Say you have two alkenes on the molecule. Say you have two rings in the molecule. What do you do now? And this way, it's always about, I get it, not that I memorized it. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at a live example. We already talked about redox a little bit. So what if I give you a primary alcohol and I tell you to oxidize it? What do I get if I oxidize a primary alcohol? Well, I can get a, an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid. So the initial oxidation will go to an aldehyde. And then if I oxidize it again, it'll go to a carboxylic acid. How do I make the reaction take two steps? Like how do I, how do I ensure it goes one step at a time? I see strong and weak oxidizing reagent. Absolutely correct. The typical oxidizing reagents that you memorized will go straight to the carboxylic acid. These reagents, when they're reactive, they go all the way. So what have we talked about? Uh, KMNO4, Na2Cr207, all of that straight to the carboxylic acid. How can I make sure it stops at the aldehyde? I have to use a different reagent. So we talked about PCC already. How do you make it memorable so that you remember that one stops? Come up with a mnemonic. So one of my students says, hey, it starts with a P. It's a prude. What do you know about prudes? They don't go all the way. PCC does not go all the way. The rest of the oxidizing reagents will. How do you recognize the rest of the oxidizing reagents? They all have a ton of oxygens in it. right? So look for the patterns. Look for the clues. And you can remember it. Anytime I ask this question, I get somebody telling me lithium aluminum hydride. Don't mix it up. Remember what we said. Lithium aluminum hydride has a lot of hydrogens. Carboxylic acid has a lot of oxygen. So if we react it with a very high hydrogen reagent, it's going to, first of all, have more hydrogens. And even the oxygen got a hydrogen. So the hydrogen reagent adds a lot of hydrogen. The oxygen reagent adds a lot of bonds to oxygen. Well, you also know of NABH4 as another oxidizing reagent. And then maybe you memorize that NABH4 does not reduce carboxylic acids. So you're thinking, okay, one of them doesn't reduce carboxylic acids. How do I remember which one? Don't just take it as fact. Ask yourself, what's the difference between the aluminum and the boron? Why is it that this is a weaker reagent. And I actually have a video on YouTube, lithium aluminum hydride versus sodium borohydride, that explains about the size, about how they hold on to each other, and so on. Dibel, similar. I have another video on that. Why it doesn't reduce everything, but why it reduces specific ones that other reagents won't touch. Again, give it some characteristic, understand about it. In the video, I actually compare these two to nannies. Right? Give you a real world example. Nannies on their cell phones, very easy to remember because how many people are not on their cell phones these days? The same thing applies when you're looking for the product of a reaction without the mechanism. So, for example, how many are familiar with the Diels Alder reaction? If I have a diene and a dienophile, and this is a very crude example, very simple, the product is going to be a cyclohexene. I have a separate video on the mechanism if this is something that you need in more detail. Now we're just using it as an example, so we're going to go through it quickly. But if the bonds all move in a ring, then this moves, this moves, and this moves. So let's see where they went. The skeleton is exactly the same. The green bond moved here. The purple bond moved here. 
and the blue bond moved here. That's the cyclohexene. Once you know the mechanism, you can take it a step further and ask yourself, how do I get the answer without always doing this, pushing arrows, figuring out where the bonds go? What did I ultimately do? I broke this bond so I could make this bond. I broke this bond so I could make this bond. I broke this bond so I can make this bond, which is our product. This gives me a pattern. Oh, so anytime I have a pericyclic reaction, like Diels Alder being one of them, I could just use the pattern of make a bond, break a bond, make a bond, break a bond, just follow until you finish. So if you're given a product, if you're given a molecule on your exam that looks like this, and you're told to come up with the starting material for this molecule, it's very easy. Let's identify our pattern. We have six carbons with an alkene. So if we number them 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B. And we number it the same way here, 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B. We find the new bond, and we take the pattern of break a bond, make a bond, break a bond, make a bond, break a bond, make a bond. Notice that I completely severed these two pieces. That is what my starting molecule would have had to look like. So that means what I have here is 1, 2, 3, and 4 attached to this carbon up here, which I'll just put here, the two pi bonds that we formed, and then A and B just looks like that. Right? We learned a reaction. We learned a mechanism. We found a pattern. We identified the pattern, and then we used that to save a lot of time on the exam. Now, I teach a lot of these patterns, a lot of these tricks in the study hall in very detailed videos. I have some on YouTube even more in the study hall. If that's something that you want to look into, the link is layerforsci.com slash join. But I'm going to urge you to use this for any reaction you see. Learn it. Understand it. Identify a pattern that repeats over and over. And once you understand it first, remember I said start with understanding, you can then memorize the pattern and apply it because it's based on something you know and understand. The trick now is to ask yourself, if there is a reagent that I don't know or that I don't understand, is there some sort of pattern, some sort of clue that I can recognize? So in the comments, I'm seeing 9BBN. 9BBN looks very scary. A lot of students see this on the exam. They have no idea what to do. Well, it's got a boron. What does boron do? It's going to react very similarly to other boron reagents. And you probably saw this for your alkyne reactions, hydroboration. So if you see an alkene or an alkyne with some sort of boron, do hydroboration. I see MCPBA. For those of you taking the ACS, you have to know what these things are because the ACS exam, about 20% of you or more will be taking that exam, will test you straight up what does it look like. If you don't have to know what it looks like, I still recommend I not necessarily memorizing the entire structure, but knowing enough about it to understand what it does. MCPBA, to me, honestly, is just a whole lot of letters. But if we recognize that MCPBA actually tells us that we have a metachloro per benzoic acid, that means that we have a peroxy acid or a per acid is when you have what looks like a carboxylic acid with an extra oxygen in it. And at the meta position, we have a chlorine. As soon as you recognize this, what do we see now? Two oxygen. One of them wants to come off. They're not very stable. And if you react this with an alkene, it gets skewered. We have too many. We'll just skewer one, pull it off the molecule. That'll give you an epoxide. Tosylates are another one that a lot of students confuse. TSCL, what the heck is that? So again, don't memorize this, but as soon as you know this component, you recognize, oh yeah, it's that paracid thingy. Let's make an epoxide. Same thing with the tosylate. The tosylate is actually the piece once you use it with an oxygen, uh, once you use it with an alcohol. 
But what we have is a toluene, which is benzene with a methyl group, with a sulfonyl, which is a carbonyl made out of sulfur. So it's a double, sul double carbonyl, and I put that in quotes because it's really a sulfur in the middle. And it's got a chlorine. Once you recognize that, and you know that an alcohol likes to attack anything that kind of looks like that, this right here makes alcohol into a very good leaving group. It's a bribing reagent. What else am I seeing in the comments? THF, uh, let's move this over, is just a straight up memorization thing. And when I was taking Orgo, I didn't even know what THF was. I just recognized that it came up in specific reactions. So THF is just a cyclic ether that will come up as a polar aprotic solvent because oxygen to carbon is slightly polar, but there's no proton sitting on oxygen, just on carbon. And so on. So are you seeing how we're taking the molecule, we're taking the region, and we're looking for something about it to make it more recognizable? I see PT. PT is platinum. It's metal. It's a straight-up memorization. What does metal do? Uh, HGOAC. This is, again, a straight-up what does it do? So let's take a look. And I'm picking on the ones that are a little bit more complex. So HGOAC2 is a mercury. That should tell you oxymercuration, mercuriation, oxymercuration. Lindlar's catalyst, Colin, that's another good one. A Lindlar's catalyst is just a name. It doesn't tell us anything. But if you recognize that Lindlar's catalyst is really a poisoned metal catalyst, then you know, okay, Lindlar's catalyst has got quinoline in it. Half your professors won't even mention that. But a poisoned metal catalyst, what does that mean? Metal helps reduction, catalyzes reduction. Poison tells us that it's slow. It's less efficient. Well, what do we know about a Lindlar's catalyst? If we have an alkyne, and I'll purposely put this one internal, if we react this with H2 and a Lindlar's catalyst, well, what does a metal catalyst do to pi bonds? It reduces them, but it's poisoned, so it doesn't go all the way. It does half a reaction. That means we just break one pi bond, and the reason we know it's cis is because metal tends to grab it from one face so the hydrogens will get added to the same face. So we're looking for different clues about it to give us the different pieces of that reaction. If we take the other version of this partial reduction and we do dissolving metal reduction, for example, sodium and liquid ammonia, if you recognize that this sodium metal is neutral, not the spectator that you're used to seeing everywhere else, then you'll know that it's a radical. It's only got one valence electron because it's in group one on the periodic table. And because it's a radical, the electrons in the intermediate want to be as far away from each other as possible. The hydrogens ultimately go as far away from each other as possible. And that gives you the cis versus trans rather than a straight up memorization. I'm seeing some other ones, Jones reagent. Tollens reagent. What are Jones and Tollens reagents? Even if you don't know what Jones and Tollens are specifically, because a lot of professors will just, they won't even tell you, it'll show up in your lab manual. They're oxidizing reagents. Well, they have O's in them. <laughs> That's enough, right? Okay, we're doing some sort of lab test that has to do with oxidation. We can go all day with examples, but in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it here because my goal was not to give you all the answers. My goal is to teach you how to think so you can find the pattern, so you can find the clues. And based on what we've gone through today, do you feel like you have a much better idea how you should be approaching memorization in the future? Hint, hint, it's not straight up memorization. It's going to be understanding what do I understand? Let me find a pattern. Actually, let's write this down. So in summary, 
we want to understand. Definitely, definitely, definitely have a foundation. Memorize the smart way so that you're not doing straight up boring, have no idea what is going on here memorization. And the third big takeaway from today is I definitely recommend that you get James's guide so that you have a good solid resource anytime you get stuck or anytime you don't recognize a reagent. I'm going to give you a quick preview of what the guide looks like. This is not the current version because this is a complimentary copy that G James gave me a while ago. So as you can see, it says version 1.2 July 2011. I believe it's been updated since. But I just want to give you an idea of what, is, what this is. And this version is 68 pages. So don't go printing it out. <laughs> it's going to be a waste of paper. But when you buy it, just save a copy to your computer, to your laptop, so you can access it from wherever. And uh, some of these pages he actually has on the sign-up page so you can get an idea. So there's a quick index where you can go through things, but then it gets more detailed. So if I want to find something, I'll just hit Control-F on a PC. I don't know how this works on a Mac, but just use the Control function. And let's say we want to know more about chromic acid. So I typed in chromic acid. And obviously, we have it right here. It says H2CRO4. Say, I didn't know what chromic acid was. Guys, a quick hint, chromic acid is omic acid with an O oxidation. It's a strong oxidant for alcohols, which is where you learned it. But let's see more about it. Let's say I want to know more. So right here, chromic acid, very important, very simple. H2CRO4, we have a pKa value. Look how strong that pKa value is. Remember, high Ka, low pKa, strong acid. And it tells us a little bit about it. Let's say I want to know more. Look at that. So again, just more detail, not too much because you don't want to be overwhelmed, but we have what it's used for, similar or equivalent to. Look at all the other examples that you should recognize, right? So somebody put chromate in the comments earlier, uh, NaCrO4, Na2Cr2O7. Do you see how they're so similar? But they're not. But if you panic and forget, just look. Seven oxygen, seven oxygen, four oxygen, four oxygen, three oxygen oxidizing reagent, and he gives you a little bit more for the really, really important reagents so that you understand enough about it so that when it comes up and scares you, you just look it up, get the information, and I'm going to assume that's it on chromic acid. Yep. So it just brought us back to the beginning. Um, most of the common reagents that you are going to come across will be in here. Some are not going to be, and that's okay, but having something like this to make sure that you don't have to go scour the internet, and you don't have to go figuring it out, trying to figure out if what you found online is correct or not, I think it's definitely, definitely, definitely worth having. And the link again, layaforsci.com slash guide, will have a link to his page where you can buy it. If you're interested in the other things he has, because he's got some summary sheets and whatnot, that 15% discount applies to everything. It's not just the reagent guide. I haven't looked at the other ones, but the reagent guide is the one that I absolutely hands down recommend. Uh, taking the time into account, let's go for about 10 minutes of Q&A. Let's keep the Q&A relevant to what we discussed today, keeping in mind that if you have other questions, um, depending on what they are. If they're just simple questions, send me an email. If they're study questions, I'm going to recommend you join the study hall because it's all about helping you with study questions. Questions, what are your recommendations for stereochemistry and regioselectivity for these reactions? Valerie, that's a very good question because when you're studying the reaction initially, you don't even look at any of that, right? You just look at alkene gets a bromine, but does it become a chiral molecule? Is there inversion, for example, in substitution? Do we have a racemic product? For example, substitution again, but SN2 versus SN1. What you want to do here is take it to the next step and ask yourself, what do I recognize about it? For example, if I were to give you something that looks like this, where I have a simple chiral molecule with a leaving group, and then I want to do a substitution reaction, what happens here? So you have to know, do I go 
SN1 or SN2 route, recognize that, and then determine what the chirality will be in the product. So I can react this either with CH3O minus in DMSO, or I can react this with CH3OH, and I'm going to put this as or so you don't think it's a solvent, in nothing. And then you take it to the next step. What do I know about the reagents? O minus negative bully direct attack inversion. Recognize that the bully pushes out from the other side, right? If a bully comes up behind the kid and pushes the kid from the back, the kid falls forward, the bully is behind. That's the SN2 reaction. But if the quiet kid waits for the bully to get bored of the swing, that would be this example. It's neutral, it's chill, it's not very strong. It can choose to come to the swing from the front or the back. So we can have both types of products forming. So when you're studying reactions, look for patterns about the stereochemistry. Syn versus anti-addition would fall into what you asked. Ask yourself why does reduction happen as a syn addition? Well, the middle catalyst grabs the pi bond, grabs both carbons from the same face, and I'm pretending to hold something in front of me, and if it's holding it from the same face, the hydrogens go together. If I do halogenation, the bromonium bridge it'd be our two example, would block the other bromine from coming from the same side, so it has to go to the other side. It's not that you memorize an anti-addition, it's that you recognize something about the mechanism, even without doing the mechanism, will still determine it's anti because it blocks. So use that. Try to find a pattern about the direction of the reaction to help you figure out the next step. Question, how do we come up with a variety of examples without changing the conditions of the reaction so much that the same reagent is no longer applicable? Dana, don't go crazy. Understand the limitations of the reaction and then make very slight changes. Linear to ring. Add a methyl group. Add a degree of substitution. Remove a degree of substitution. So if you have an alkene reaction, and I keep using alkenes because it's so basic that everyone can relate to it, you can have uh, a propene, which is just a... One side is not substituted, one side is one substitution. Then you can go to a 2-butene, you can go with cis and trans 2-butene, you can go with 2-methyl 2-butene, you can turn it into a ring, you can substitute the ring. So we're not going too crazy, we're not suddenly using benzene, which wouldn't work for your typical alkene reactions, but we're slowly adding one piece. And if you're not sure, try to find problems in your books that are similar enough, and then use that and just find like three to five different starting molecules and practice those over and over. I have Colin okay. on the line, and Colin is a Lay for Science study hall member who uses my resources. And Colin, what I want you to tell everyone is, as someone who's used the Lay for Science resources and has access to all of my cheat sheets, why do you feel the reagent guide is absolutely necessary for orgo students, just so they can hear it from a student perspective? I just think it's a great summary and it's in a format where you can easily refer to each reagent and look at the mechanisms right there under the name of reagent and see why it works and the justifications for why it works. It's all really condensed in an easy to follow format. There's no mistakes I've found. Um, it's clearly taken hundreds of hours to put all this information together, maybe, well, maybe tens of hours. But it just saves you a ton of time versus plowing through your textbook and looking up and saying, all right, okay, that's why that reagent works. Amen to that. And um, so, guys, from, from a student, and this is very similar to the feedback I've heard from students over the years in recommending the guide. All right, so here's what happens. When you go to the link... And right now it redirects to here. I'm going to change it so it goes to an info page with a video that has a link to this. So when you go to layerforsci.com slash guide, you'll see info about this. You click the link, that'll bring you here. That's to the Master Organic Chemistry Store. Now this discount applies to all of his products, but specifically the reagent guide is the one that I am familiar with and the one I recommend. When you click buy this, you can write here... Uh, in the comments, heard about this from Leia Fish or Leia Versailles. He knows my name, so either way works. Click checkout. And then here, obviously enter all your information. Put Leia for, helps if I spell my own name correctly. Leia Versailles, apply. 
and that will immediately take 15% off your price. Now, the price itself is subject to change depending on uh, when you purchase this, but the 15% discount, as far as we have discussed, will be available always. So just do that, that will give you the discount, and then fill in all of your information, sign up. It's delivered by via email, so you get access to it right away. It's all online. If there are any issues, he's very good about communication. Just, you know, the guy has kids, he has a family, give him a chance to respond, but usually within a few days he'll take care of any issues that you can possibly have with this.